in his teaching, he, Jesus, was saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury and how many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owns, all she had to live on. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Charles Chinequa is a name you might not be familiar with, but in the 1800s, he was one of the more famous American pastors. He was Canadian by birth, born in 1809 in rural Canada, raised in a staunchly Roman Catholic family. He wanted really only one thing and one thing only as he was growing up. He wanted to be a Catholic priest when, when he was older. He was devoutly Catholic. When he was a young boy, though, his father unexpectedly suddenly died. Because of the rural place in which they lived, it took a, a few days for the priest to make it out to their home. And the priest came and Charles, his little boy, was extremely intimidated by the priest and he hid for much of this conversation. But he records the conversation in his book called 50 Years in the Roman Church. Now, just a quick word about him. If you're you know, a fan of Abraham Lincoln, you're probably familiar with Charles Chinequa. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I agree with everything that he said in some of his wilder conspiracy theories in his, his book are sort of strange. But this story I'm about to tell you from the chapter in his book called The Priest, Purgatory, and the Widow's Cow has stuck in my mind ever since I, I read it. And so I want to share it with you because it really captures the hideousness of a religion that exploits widows. Charles is a boy hid, hid behind the curtain and watched this encounter with the priest and his mother. The priest came in and he said his mother was still stricken by, by grief. And the priest began the conversation, letting her know that her husband was in the flames of purgatory. But he said, hope was not lost. They could do masses to lessen his time there. Now this would have been standard fare for Charles the raised in the Catholic Church, he would have understood that. But this is where the, the censure came. He records this in his book in direct Correspondence, so he's relaying it as a direct quote, even though it was written, you know, a decade later. So I'm not hinging every word on this, but it captures it really well. I'll read it to you like he wrote it. Quote, Madam, if you want your husband to be delivered, you must necessarily unite your personal sacrifices to the prayers of the church and the masses which we will offer. But to offer masses for the rest of your husband's soul is costly and, of course, must be paid in advance. He writes, my mother covered her face with her handkerchief and wept. But as for me, I did not mingle my tears with hers this time. My feelings were not of grief, but of anger and unspeakable horror. My eyes were fixed on the face of the man who tortured my mother's heart. My hands were clenched as if ready to strike. All of my muscles trembled. All of my teeth chattered as if from intense cold. My greatest sorrow in my life was my weakness in that moment in the presence of that big man. I felt like saying to him, are you not ashamed, you who are so rich, to come and take away the last piece of bread from our mouths? And I'll spare you the details of how the rest of the chapter unfolds. But his mom eventually offered the priest their cow, their only cow, saying this was an incredible sacrifice for them. The cow was all they had to live on. But if that was what was necessary to, quote, extinguish those devouring flames, and then so be it. When the priest left the door, Charles watched him out the window, wondering if he would go left to exit their property or right to fetch the cow. And of course, the priest went right. And the boy began crying as the priest led away the cow to his mother, saying, why did you let him do this? And the mother said, I never would have offered had I thought he actually would have taken it. Well, Charles became a Catholic priest 
and rose to the ranks, eventually went to Chicago, crossed into the United States and was a priest in Chicago, rising to the Catholic ranks for a while. When his mother died, her last words to him were this, I ask you never to be so hard-hearted towards poor widows as are the priests. And this ended up sparking him leaving the Catholic Church. He wrote a book saying how the whole system of purgatory and masses for the dead all hinges together with the point of exploiting the poor, exploiting the widows to get their, their cash. Once he wrote some of these letters, he, I mean, he published them in papers and sent them all over the place. He was excommunicated by the Catholic Church. And then he was sued for libel. And as the case went to trial, he hired Abraham Lincoln to be his attorney, which is why you may have heard of his name. Lincoln got him off. He was acquitted when witnesses refused uh, to testify going against Lincoln in court. Even then, it was a surmountable obstacle. Now, I'm not saying that explo exploitation of widows began in Canada in the 1800s. It's been a mark of false religion all through time. If you go back to the days of Martin Luther, when he led the Protestant Reformation against the, the abuses in the Catholic Church. If you remember, he started it with the 95 Theses. Most of those 95 Theses aren't about justification. They're not about salvation. They're about the exploitation of the poor and the grieving for the sake of buying people's souls out of purgatory. And this was something Luther had firsthand experience with as well. Luther believed the gospel for several years, as, even as a Catholic priest, and he saw the gospel make incredible inroads in his congregation. He saw people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and he was pouring out his life discipling these people. He saw them grow in godliness and grow in their love for scripture so much, only to have it all taken away from them if a loved one died. Despite all they've been hearing about the gospel for the past few years in our Luther's <laughs> ministry, when a loved one died, they would find themselves in the clutches of an indulgent salesman, saying that <laughs> you put money into the offering and your loved one's soul will be freed from purgatory. And Luther would spend his life with these people, years of his time with these people, and they would come back after a loved one's death broke and bankrupt because they poured their money into the system. This isn't unique to Catholicism either. You see this kind of snake oil salesman shenanigans even in evangelical Christianity. You see the, the guys on TV, you know, begging you, send all your money to me. You have cancer, it's because you're holding on to your money. Send it to me and you'll be healed. You're not healed, you didn't send in enough money to me, they say. Benny Hinn, this very week, Benny Hinn has a blog post up about Mark 12 where he calls any widows that are reading his blog post to, send, to follow the example of the widow in Mark 12 and send him all of their money, just like this widow did. The whole system is perverse. It's designed to exploit people who are weak, who are gullible, who are mourning and have them part with their money. When I was in seminary, I wrote a letter to one of these guys just to see what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> I got back a prayer shawl that you were supposed to wrap around you and the shawl would be empowered when you sent them money. Um, so you'd wrap the prayer shawl around you. It also came with this, this life-size picture of the man that you, un, you, know, you fold it out, it was folded up, you unfolded like a map and you're supposed to tape it to your refrigerator and it had his hands up and you know, standing there like this in a suit and everything and you're supposed to put your hands on his hands and your nose on his nose and pray and that was the power that was gonna forgive you. It also came with a dollar bill, so I made a dollar off of this. <laughs> you're supposed to fold the dollar bill up, the instruction said, and put it in the section of Leviticus that talks about the year of Jubilee. Close your Bible, stick it under your pillow, Keep your Bible closed, of course. <laughs> Stick it under your pillow. When you wake up in the morning, take the dollar out and mail it along with whatever other money you have back to him. And that was his seed. He planted the dollar with you. You plant your money with him. And then they'll return, God will return the blessing. You send your money to him and then God will treat that like a seed and send you more money than you sent in. And then you send that back to him and then God will send you more money. And it's this, this pyramid scheme. You just get rich and rich and rich because you're following the the year of Jubilee pattern, sending him all of your money. I took the dollar and I folded it up and put it in my Bible in Mark 12 next to this passage. There's a warning about what false religion does to people. You know, we live in an age where we have such an ecumenical attitude. What's the big deal about different religions? What's the big deal? It's not just Catholicism. It's not just Christianity. You see this in Eastern religions too. You go to Bhutan or 
Nepal or Tibet or parts of India and you have the same attitude designed to oppress people that you need, if you're in poverty, stay in poverty. Don't get yourself out of that. That's where God wants you to be. If you were to work your way out of poverty or get medical attention or try to make your life better or learn to read or something, you're only perpetuating your cycle of suffering. This is what all false religion has in common. It oppresses people. False religion is designed to keep you away from Jesus Christ as your savior, to not trust in his death, to forgive you of your sins. And it's also designed to take your money. That's what it's designed to do. But like I said, we live in an ecumenical age where people don't really care about this so much. Why would you care? I mean, what is, so the argument goes, what is the big deal if somebody believes when they die, they go to purgatory or they go to heaven? What's the big deal? What's the big deal if somebody believes that your sins are forgiven when you do certain works or give certain money to empower your faith and activate your forgiveness? What's the big deal between that and somebody who believes that Jesus forgave their sins entirely? Listen, both of them are doing it out of faith in Jesus. What's wrong? Why would you care so much? What's the big deal about somebody who says they need to send in all their money to someone in the name of Jesus to show their faith in Jesus? What's the big deal between that person and somebody who's just giving money to their church? After all, they're both doing it in the name of Jesus. What's the big deal? Well, this is why Mark 12 ends the way it does. Jesus lets us know what the big deal is. We live in a country with disposable income in our nation. You know, religion is something you talk about with your friends or not at all, actually. And if you do talk about it, it's low key. It's over Starbucks. You know, there's nothing really at stake here. Go about, about your way when it's done. Live your life. Do your thing. Believe what you want to believe. It's not that big of a deal. And that's frankly because we have disposable income. We can give $1,000 to this or $1,000 to that and go home and you've still got your house. You've still got your car. You've still got your family waiting for you. It's not that big of a deal. Get suckered in. Why not? But that's not the way it is in most of the world. This is why these religions feed off countries that are impoverished. They milk every cent from those who are desperate, destitute, broken. This is why these false religions thrive across India. They thrive across Africa. I'm not even talking about Catholicism in that comment. What breeds through Africa is all of that shenanigans of health, wealth, prosperity. You want to be cured of AIDS? You want to you know, get a better place to live? Give your money to this guy and he'll do the trick. Those who are hopeless put their hope in shadows and they're, they're robbed not only of their hope but of their cash. This here in Mark 12 marks the end of Jesus' verbal war with the Sanhedrin. He's been teaching in the temple for a few days now and the Sanhedrin confronted him, wanted to know where his authority came from. Well, he pretty much demonstrated that, didn't he? Throughout this day, they brought trick questions to him to trap him in his words to get the crowd to turn against him. Jesus outmaneuvered them, outthought them, outpreached them at every corner. He showed that he was wiser than them, smarter than them, but more than that, that he had a mastery of scripture that they didn't have. And he exposed them to the whole crowd. He undressed their intellectual trappings so everybody could see there's nothing there. Nothing at all. So much so that when he was done, Mark says, none of them dared ask him any more questions. They didn't want to be embarrassed like the other guys. It was over as far as the crowd was concerned. The Sanhedrin lost. So Jesus now turns his attention to them and he asks them a question. Is the Messiah David's son or David's Lord? And again, we might think, what's the big deal about this? In fact, you could be forgiven if you sat through last week's message and you thought that's a complex theolo theological argument. I'm not sure what the big deal is. Why does it really matter if you say he's Jesus, the Messiah is David's son before he's his Lord or is he's Lord before he's his son? Why does that even matter? Jesus shows why it matters. Because these men did not know what they were talking about. And they were taking people captive through their false teaching. So Jesus now, after humiliating him with that basic question about the Messiah, is he David's son or David's Lord? What do you say? They couldn't, I mean, these religious leaders of Israel couldn't even answer the most basic question about the Messiah. So Jesus now turns from them and turns to the crowd. And this is his last comments to the crowd. These are his last, this is his last public discourse. In our text this morning, he's going to leave the temple. He's not coming back. 
He's done with this. This is his last showdown with the, the Pharisees and the scribes until they arrest him. Even then, the trial is in darkness. These are his last words to the crowd. And this is what he leaves them with. Beware. He shows why it matters. He shows that this is, when you're dealing with false religion, there's real people involved. There are real people with real victims who are really losing all they have in this world. That's why it matters. That's why it matters what you believe about the afterlife. That's why it matters if you believe that your sins were forgiven by Jesus or if you have to do things prescribed to you by a religious leader to activate that forgiveness. That's why it matters if you believe that Jesus is the only way to have your sins forgiven or if that you have to fund certain services to get a loved one out of the flames of purgatory. This is exactly why it matters. It's not a big deal because everybody believes in Jesus. It's a big deal because people are losing their hope and losing their lives as they're held captive by this kind of system. It matters in the next life, of course, but it matters in this life because these religious systems fill their ranks with victim after victim. Scripture says that all false religions are demonically inspired and this is why. They oppress people. They shackle you to the traditions and superstitions. They tell you what you can and can't eat on certain days, what you can and can't wear, what you can and can't say, who you can and can't give your money to. It micromanages your life and the end's goal is to get in your pocketbook to control you, to rob you. That's what they have in common. And that's why Jesus chooses at the end of three years of public ministry. This is how his public ministry ends, a warning against those kind of religions. The warning really breaks into three parts. The first part of the warning is beware of the thieves. Beware of the thieves. He was saying in this verb tense, he was saying, he's walking around saying this over and over and over again all afternoon on Tuesday. He's saying it again and again and again. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They had these long, flowing, colorful robes, red and blue. It was designed so that you could easily identify them. Look at how holy that guy must be because look at his robe. They had these elaborate hats and things wrapped around their head with tassels and boxes with verses hanging off the ends of their robes and the side of their hats. I mean, these things were ornate and elaborate. And so they would walk in and you, your eyes would see this person. He could walk in any room and you'd be drawn to him and you would say, that is a scribe. That is a religious man. How do you know he's religious? Well, look at how he's dressed. How righteous that man must be to wear, <laughs> to get to wear that kind of robe. They walked around in those things all the time because they liked being noticed. Jesus said they liked respectful greetings in the marketplace. They loved wearing that robe out when they went to the marketplace so that everybody would come up to them and greet them respectfully. Oh, I can tell that you are a man of God. Look at what, what a privilege it is to shop in the same store you're shopping in. And they might even act put out like, oh, can I just go and buy my oranges? That's all I want to do today. Can't go, can't go anywhere wearing this. But they loved it, Jesus says. They ate it up. They loved being interrupted and greeted by everybody. And that's why they wore them all the time. You see that today. You see people wearing those things that identify them as a man of God out in public or on the plane or train or whatever. That's, that's the goal here. Can't you just greet them respectfully? They loved the chief seats in the synagogue. Synagogues were designed much like churches are designed. Rows of seats facing forward. The speaker would be at the front. They also had benches along the side, some of them going up. So like stadium style, like almost like a high school basketball arena style. Seats on the floor facing forward, seats along the wall facing in. The speaker would stand up front, but behind the speaker was another bench. And the scribes loved to sit on that with their robes and their tassels. They got to sit there. You all had to look at the speaker, but the scribe got to look over the speaker at you. They loved sitting there. What a symbol of their power. What a symbol of their godliness. They got their own bench in the synagogue. You better look out for them. <laughs> they loved that kind of stuff. And it wasn't limited just to the synagogues. By the way, you see some of that in the kind of charismatic health wealth churches today that have those, the, I'm sure you've seen this on TV, the, the churches with the line of gold thrones on the back. So all the assistant pastors get to sit up there on the gold thrones and look out at everybody looking at the man of God preaching. 
It wasn't limited to the synagogues, by the way. They loved those seats, the banquets, Jesus says. They wanted the best seats and banquets. They had this complex system that we've talked about earlier in Mark. It's come up before in Mark. But they had this complex system that where you sat at earthly banquets was a picture of where you would sit in God's kingdom. And so there was this convoluted system about, you know, a pecking order and a hierarchy of the scribes. There's 70 of these scribes. And believe me, every one of them knew their, their, their place in the pecking order. They knew their place in the food chain. They knew that if they were the highest guy at the banquet, then they got this seat. But if that scribe over there showed up, they had to move to this seat. But if that guy showed up, they'd be at that seat. And if those four guys showed up, then I'd be at a different table altogether. This is the attitude that was behind James's question to Jesus earlier in Mark. Lord, can we sit at your right and your left in the kingdom? Not thinking it spilled over even to the disciples, but it comes from these leaders. That's, they're the ones that model it. They love those seats. But you know what they really love? More than any of those things, more than their robe, more than where they sit in the synagogue, more than their banquets. What they love, verse 40, is to devour widows' houses. That's, that's what they really like to eat. How do they rob from widows? Well, in the temple, they have these 13 receptacles. They're called shofar chests is how you transliterate it. They're shaped like a shofar, that horn that curves up. They had 13 of them lining the temple. Most of them were in the court of the women, but some of them were in the, the court of the Gentiles in the inner court. And you would throw your money in there. And there are these, you know, upside down trumpets would be a good way to, to put it, like a French horn coming up into the air. And you'd put your money in, it would make a loud sound. It would clank in as it rolled around in there. And you've probably seen these, as, I think some of the Smithsonian museums have those where you drop your quarter and it goes around the side. <laughs> Clunk. You drop a penny in, it makes a way different sound. <laughs> That's what these things were. And they had this system designed where these grieving widows would come and they would bring their money and they would drop it in the chute and give it. They love taking people's money. It wasn't just widows. They take anybody's money. But man, those widows were easy targets. They loved it. They devoured their houses whole. What a contrast between the religion that God loves. God loves all people, but he has a special love for those who are needy, those who are afflicted, for widows and orphans. Not false religions. They're targets for them and they love devouring their homes. More than that, they cover this all for appearance sake, Jesus says, by offering long prayers. How do they get away with this? You're likely thinking, how can they get away with just taking everybody's money like this? Don't people speak out against it? Oh, no. They cover their tracks well. Look, first of all, look at their appearance with their robes and hats and they sit at the best seats. I mean, they're so highly esteemed, but they cover it with their prayers too. They pray so long. Don't ask them to pray to banquet because they will keep on going. Your food will be cold. <laughs> They'll just keep trucking along in that prayer. They love praying in front of people. Why? Because it covers their tracks. That's what Jesus means by for appearances sake. You wouldn't look at him and say, you know, that guy's just in it for the money. He's just taking money from widows. That's all he's doing. You would never say that because you listen to him pray and you think, oh, anybody who prays like that and dresses like that has got to be legit. It's all designed to blind you. Jesus says, beware of those people. Beware. Because they will receive the greater condemnation. Well, greater than who? But greater than the people who are caught up in those false religions. Greater than the people who are stuck in those religious systems. There's no way to heaven except through belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Apart from that, people will receive judgment for their sin. But a greater judgment falls on the leaders of those religions. Hell's not equal for everybody. And the greater punishment seen in hell falls on the heads of those who lead those religions. The heads of those who take the widow's cow, the heads of those who take the widow's might, the heads of those who exploit the poor in the morning. They will be judged by God. So you should beware of them, Jesus says. Beware of them. They are thieves. Be on the lookout. Not only are you supposed to be aware of the thieves, then the warning moves a little bit. Beware of the thieves, but second, care for the, the victims. Have compassion on the victims. See them as victims. The people who are caught in these systems, they are victims of it. Jesus then sits down opposite the treasury. 
and begin observing how the people were putting money into the treasury, which would be those 13 shafars. Each one of them would have a different Hebrew letter on it to indicate which part of the temple service that offering went to. You could give to the Levites animals. You could give to their clothes. You could give to the scribes clothes. You could give to the gold in the temple. You had 13 choices here. Jesus sits down after teaching in the temple for two days. I mean, he's pretty much stopped this system for two days. He turned over the tables on day one and brought it to a screeching halt. It's been shut down on day two, but now he's done teaching. Now Jesus is withdrawn. He's walked up the stairs on the side a little bit. He's perched up there. He's overlooking everything in the temple and it's kicking back into gear again. There's a backlog. People have been traveling from all over the Roman Empire to get to the temple. It's Passover week. People have been bringing their treasures from all over the empire for this temple in this week. And it's been stopped for a few days. Now the backlog is opening up and people can pour in now. And Jesus just sits and he watches them bring in all of their money. The first thing he sees is the rich people putting money into the treasury. Oh, and he says, many of them were putting in very large sums. They came with their arms full, just dumping it in. Next to each of these shofars would be a, a scribe who is notating how much you were putting in. Jotting it down for posterity's sake, of course. And then Jesus just marvels at this. People bringing money from all over the empire, Jews from the dispersion everywhere, coming back, dropping armfuls of money into these things, making these loud racket as it goes down the, the chute. And Jesus, remember earlier, the Sermon on the Mount described how some of these people would even bring trumpets with them. You know, those who wanted to give an extra big amount of money would blast a trumpet. I mean, as if the sound of the money going in wasn't enough and just the, just, it would only be observed by the scribe right next to him. You wanted everybody to see how much you were given. You'd blast a trumpet before you dumped it all in. I mean, this thing is, it's a rodeo what's going on here. And he just marvels at that. Now, you might be tempted to think that these guys who are dumping in tens of thousands of dollars, that they're the real victims in this. I mean, look at how much money they're losing to this system. How sad it is that that landowner over there just dropped in $10,000 or that guy $20,000 or this guy $5,000 or this guy $700. That's a lot of money they just parted with. How sad it is that they're losing their money that way. But they're not the real victims. I mean, if anything, they're enabling the system. They give their tens of thousands of dollars and they go home to their family still waiting for them. Their farm's still there. Their slaves still there. That's who they're going home to. And then Jesus' eyes in verse 42 turn to a different person. A poor widow came. She put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. It's actually, it's a lipta is the the currency, it looked as a very thin coin. It's the thinnest of the coins that were in circulation. It's the smallest amount of currency. That's why the NAS translates as, as a cent. It's, you know, like a penny. It's actually 164th, your footnotes might even say this, 164th of a denarius, which was the average day wage for a day laborer. 164th of that is what she puts in. So let's make the math easy here. Let's say to adjust for inflation and all that, let's say that the average day laborer in our American culture works an eight hour day and gets eight bucks an hour, you get 64 bucks. This is 164. She comes in with a dollar. That's all she has, two dollars really. That's all she has. It's the smallest coin possible. They didn't have, you know, they break it down like we do. This is, this is, this is everything, Jesus says. This is all she has to live on. It should remind you of the widow in 2 Kings 4. Remember that Elisha came up to and asked her what she was doing. She said, I have a spoonful of food. I'm going to eat it, split it with my son. We're both going to eat it. And we're going to go home and die because it's all we have. You know what Elisha said? Can I have some of that too? <laughs> this is that kind of scene. She has $2. She's going to drop it in. Clink, clink. She turns around to go home and die. There's no family waiting for her. There's no farm waiting for her. There's no slaves waiting. This is, this is all she has, Jesus says. It's it. It's done for her. She is so desperate and so broken. She comes to this place. This is the only place that she thinks she can find hope. Where is she going to go for hope? She goes here to the temple. If anybody can care for her, it would be this place. And she does what she's been taught to do. Drop in all that she has. She is the victim here. 
you might think it's not that big of a deal what they're doing to her. She only was parted with $2. Those other guys lost thousands of dollars. She only lost two. No, it's the opposite. You need to use this God's exchange rate here. God looks at the heart and, she know, and God knows how desperate she is, how broken she is. Don't think this isn't a big deal, this widow, because of how little she was taken for. No, it's a huge deal because of how much they took from her. They took from her everything. Here's another way of saying it. The effects of these kind of false religions on the middle class are negligible. You go home and everybody's still there. But the effects of these kind of religions on the poor, the destitute, the hopeless, it's huge. The more desperate you are, the more gullible you are, the more desperate you are, the more you fall for this, the more (coughs) grieving you are, the more this system makes sense. And you get stuck in the web of it. These are the real victims, Jesus says. This is why false religion matters. Because it's exploiting these kind of people. You know, how is giving in a church different than this kind of giving? And I bring that question up because a lot of you, I'm sure, have always understood this passage to be like a model for giving, which I've never really got my mind around that. (laughs) You know, she's not the model. We're not telling you give all you have. <laughs> lock the doors, Clint, lock the doors, shake down. Everybody give what they have. <laughs> That's not the model. I want you to see the huge gulf between the giving in the church and this kind of giving in false religions. In false religion, you're giving to try to buy hope and demonstrate righteousness and it always bankrupts you. In the church, don't give out of obligation. You're not demonstrating your righteousness by giving to us. You're giving because you want to partner with the church. We're a family. We're all in this together. You give to the church because you want to partner with us. You want to send our missionaries around the world to preach the real gospel in countries that are held in the grip of this kind of religion. That's why you give. You give because you want to fund the the ministries of the church, the pastors of this church to study the word and to disciple people and to do the ministry of the church. You enjoy partnering with this. You trust what the church is doing and you want to be part of it. You want your money to be part of it. That's why you give. And if you don't trust this church and if you feel like I don't want to give because I don't trust what the church is doing with the money, then you should find a different church, really. Find, not out of obligation, but find a church where you're excited about what they're doing. If you're going to be here and worship with us, be excited about what we're doing. But if you're a reluctant giver or you don't want to give because it, or it's a sense of duty, you're like, I need to give out of a sense of duty. Don't give. If you only have a few dollars left, you feel like this woman, if I give this, I'm going to go home and die. Look, we don't want your money then. This is why Paul says the Lord loves a generous or a joyful giver. I pray that everybody who gives this church would be excited about what they're doing and would be eager to partner with us as we're doing it. That's the idea. It's not the widow shakedown here. And I hope you see it. There's an ocean of difference between those two approaches to giving. This is this poor woman, woman becomes such a picture of this. You know, this week, the pastors of the church spent an hour this week praying through 1 Timothy 5 seeking the Lord's will and how can we better care for the widows in the congregation. I hope you see that is the mark, marked difference between the false religions and the gospel. I mean, God loves all people, but he has a particular, particular love for the widows, the poor, the afflicted, the orphans. Other religions exploit them, but in God's care, people who love God care for them. I mean, this is even in the Old Testament. When false religions were sacrificing infants to their, their, pay, their false gods, God rebukes those religions and says he's going to judge them because they're sacrificing his children, his innocent children. God had a special love and a special care for those poor, defenseless children. This is why the New Testament says pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is this, that you visit widows and orphans in their affliction. You care for them. You meet their needs when they're part of the church. You don't exploit them. But that's what false religion does. And I I pray that you would see these people as victims of this scheme. Thirdly, you flee the systems. You flee the systems. You beware the thieves. You care for the victims. You flee from these false systems. 
Verse thir- th- chapter 13, verse 1, he was going out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. As Jesus leaves the temple here, don't overlook the fact he's not coming back. It's done. He's not setting foot in that temple again. This was God's place for God's people for so long, but no more. They rejected their Messiah. He's not going to come back to this temple again. Those were his last public words to the crowd in the temple. He's done teaching them. He's done with the whole temple system. He's walking away from it. And as he's walking away to the the Mount of Olives, which is right next to the temple, by the way, it's across the creek up the hill. It's as far away from the temple as this giant is from us right now. It's on the other side of a little ravine, but you see it in all of its beauty and all of its grandeur. It's right there. And as they stand there looking at it, after this horrible scene with the widow, one of the disciples, who knows which one, but one of the disciples says, but Lord, what beautiful building. Look at the stones. And it was a beautiful building. It was massive. If I said the outer court of this temple, you could fit RFK Stadium in it. This thing was huge. It had these pillars around it. The three grown men, finger to finger, could not wrap their arms around these pillars that lined the place. These ornate shofars around the sides, these intricately woven curtains everywhere. Every utensil in it was gold or silver, pure gold, pure silver. This place was phenomenal. Gold went through every crack of all the rocks, but they didn't use cement here. They used gold. It had been being built for 50 years and it still wasn't done. Some of the stones in there that have been discovered by archaeologists are 42 feet long, weighing over a million tons. Don't picture like a cool church you once saw. (laughs) Picture this massive temple overshadowing everything in Jerusalem. And there they are right across the ravine. And one of the disciples says, how pretty it is. God must be at work is the implication. God must be blessing this. This must be so pleasing because look at how magnificent it is. And Jesus says, no way. Do you see these great buildings? He asks in verse two. Do you see them? Is that what you're, the buildings? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Don't look at the gold. Look at the fact that every drop of that gold was built off of exploiting widows. And God is not going to let a religion be built like that without judging it. You can't build a religion off of exploiting the poor and the weak and the defenseless without incurring God's wrath. God will send his judgment. People today, I mean, the basilica still stands. People look at, oh, what wonderful architecture. Look at all the gold and the ivory and the porcelain. And it's so incredibly beautiful. And in in an architectural sense, it is incredibly beautiful. But when you see the sun shine off of the gold and off the marble, you can be impressed with the architecture, but understand it was built by exploiting the most vulnerable people in the world. And God will judge those kind of religions. And we wonder, why isn't he doing it now? Why is it still there now? It took 37 years from this prophecy before the temple was destroyed. 37 years. Of course, the church initially met at the steps of the temple. That lasted a few months. And the leaders of the temple started persecuting the church, made martyrs of many of them. They scattered. The temple's no no longer their home anymore. 37 years later, the Roman army came in, decimated it, pulled brick apart from brick, melted the gold to get the gold out of it, killed tens of thousands of Jews, exiled the rest, brought Israel to a screeching halt. It remains, you know, under foreign occupation for centuries after that. This was the devastating consequence of them building a religious system off of exploiting the weak. And that's why Jesus leaves this temple with a sense of woe. Woe to those who steer people into a religion that exploits them. Woe to those who rob widows in that system. Woe to those who allow people to get trapped in that kind of work. Woe to those who exploit the weak and the poor, who tell people you're sick because you're not sending me your money. You want your loved one to get out of purgatory? Send in your check. Woe to a system that builds itself on stealing from those whom God wants protected. And God will judge that kind of system. It's waiting now, but it will come. How do you offer hope to people in that kind of system? (laughs) You bring them back to the death of Jesus. Jesus did more than observe this widow. A few days later, he's going to die on the cross to atone for her sins. 
a death that can't be purchased, forgiveness that can't be funded with two cents or $2,000. You can't buy that forgiveness. It only comes through faith that Jesus died in your place. And that's where the hope is found. If you're grieving for the loss of a loved one, your hope is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's it.